you have your Bibles, let's open together to James chapter 2. As you're doing that, we're, uh, we're going to be talking about the subject of dead faith here this morning. This is one of the, um, not necessarily more difficult, but certainly more controversial uh, passages of the Bible when it comes to how we actually uh, know that we are saved. And as I think about this particular passage, my, this week my mind went to 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, you know, all the way back in the Old Testament. If you're familiar with 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, David's not on the scene yet. Uh, Samuel is barely uh, on the scene. But uh, what we are introduced to is the high priest Eli. And in chapter 2, we're introduced to his two sons, whose names are Hophni and Phinehas. And... Uh, these two guys, like their, their father as the high priest, and uh, like Samuel with, with his sons as well, uh, they were uh, brought up to uh, lead the people in uh, religious ceremonies and to uh, be priests and prophet of God, prophets of God and, and to teach the people uh, the will of God. However, they were not good at this. Uh, in fact, they were incredibly sinful people. Uh, to the point that in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, it says, and again, this is the word of God coming through the prophet Samuel. It says, now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. And so it is, is, is kind of contrary to our, uh, our Baptist and our evangelical thinking to think that the Lord would look down on to priests and say not only they are bad priests, they shouldn't be doing this, but they are worthless men. They had surrounded themselves with faith their entire lives. They knew the Holy Scriptures. And they knew the rites and the rituals and the ceremonies for the people to commune with God. But even with all of that education and all of that head knowledge, they were worthless men in the sight of God. Generations after Hophni and Phinehas, the Apostle James wrote this letter to remind the people that we can have knowledge of God, that we can perform the ceremonies, that we can come into the church building, that we can even go through the ordinances of baptism, Lord's Supper, and not know the Savior. We have a terrible tendency to believe the falsehoods and the trappings of the prosperity gospel to say to ourselves, because I am protected, I'm relatively healthy, I'm relatively wealthy on the, the world stage, and I must be doing something right, and the Lord must be uh, finding favor with me because I am prosperous. And this is, just is not true. What James shows us is that most people who are blessed with material wealth and prosperity they are much more likely to reject God and to hoard their possessions rather than to use it to help. And for James, this simply will not be done among the church. And for God, this simply will not be done among the church. And so with that in mind, follow along with me as I read chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. We're going to finish this up here today. And the Word of God says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you, worth, or you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham, our father, justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab, the prostitute, justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. 
is dead. Whenever I was in seminary, uh, one of the classes that I had, uh, we had an interesting assignment. What we were asked to do was to come up with a, uh, it, was, it was phrased as come up with a new idea of faith. Now, if you know anything about uh, Baptist seminaries, that, that can fall into heresy real, real fast uh, if you start thinking about new ideas of faith. But the point was, you know, come up with a new way uh, of explaining, come up with a fresh take on these, uh, on these timeless, timeless truths that might help somebody in our day uh, understand the word a little bit better. And uh, I choose to, chose to do my project on James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. And the reason that I chose this was because there was and is and will continue to be a debate over what James means here, largely based on what the Apostle Paul says, that we are saved by grace through faith. Whereas James says we are justified by not faith alone, but works along with our faith. And yet here in, James, in verse 14, James opens his conversation by asking a rhetorical question, can all faith save a person? What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? This is, of course, meant to be answered no. It's actually an emphatic no. We might say, of course not. This is ludicrous to think that this type of faith would save anyone. But it was and is hard to understand. And so I was in this seminary class, and I was looking at this particular passage of Scripture, and my mind drifted back to my undergrad. I was actually a business major in my undergrad, and we had to take uh, several finance classes, economics classes, um, accounting classes. And there is, a, there is an equation within accounting for your balance sheet. And that equation says that your assets equal your liabilities plus your equity. And so basically what this means is if you want to determine your assets, uh, what you're actually worth or what your company is actually worth, you have to first take your liabilities, uh, the money that you owe in debt or the financial commitments that you have made or the bills that you know you're getting ready to, to have to pay, and you add that together with the equity that you have as a family or as a company, you know, the, uh, the, the real monetary financial property that you actually have. And only after getting those two things together do you have your real assets. And so I was thinking about this, and I don't know why my mind was drifting to this as I was in a, you know, a pastoral theology class. But I looked at James, and I looked at chapter 2, and I thought about Paul and and we know that the Bible doesn't contradict itself. And we know that there is great continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So there, there is certainly a way to, to work through this. And the professor had his way. And we would go through this in New Testament and Greek and that sort of thing. But I thought the, an easy way for me to understand it was if I would treat it like a balance sheet equation. And so what I came up with was as we're looking at true faith, what our true faith is, it is our stated belief plus our actual behavior. It is not just what we say with our mouth, and it is not just what we do with our hands. It is our stated belief, whether we would affirm God or whether we would deny God, plus our actual behavior. What are we willing to do with the faith that we say that we have? Is it just lip service? Is it just something that we talk about? Or are we willing to be the hands and feet of Jesus? And if we are, yeah, that's right. Um, and if we are doing good things, if we are behaving in a, in a right way, but we're not doing it with faith, then what does that actually mean? If it's not with belief in the understanding that God is who he says he is, that Jesus is our Savior, can that faith save us? And of course, the answer to that question is no as well. And I realize that this is not the usual sermon on faith that we like to hear. This is not teaching uh, about the faith that we will often see um, championed by people like Paul. And we're going to talk about Paul a lot here this morning because there is no contradiction between Paul and James. Just in the same way that, that uh, talking about uh, Paul's confrontation with Peter last week, there was, no, there was no animosity, there was no division or conflict between Peter and Paul. There was just a, 
a correction that needed to be made. There's no disagreement. There's no discontinuity here between James and Paul. It is all part of the, the family of faith. And as you even look at the words of Apostle, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 6, chapters, or chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, Paul talks about faith. Paul talks about the, the understanding of faith. But even in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul lists a laundry list of behaviors that if we do without repentance proves that we don't really have any faith. We just want the rewards of God. We don't want the righteousness of God, which is not faith. And so this is not a contradictory concept. This is not uh, opposing uh, opposition in terms of teaching. It is simply further explanation of what faith actually is. So how do we apply this true foundational understanding of faith? James says in verse 15, If the brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And so hoping that someone finds help is useless if we have the ability to help but refuse. We discussed this briefly Wednesday night in our discussion of community. The question there was, how do we approach the passage in Matthew chapter 5 that says, give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Basically, if someone asks something of you, you should give it. This command from Jesus does not contradict the command from God to the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, where God says, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat, even though he asks of you for food. There is a component of help, helping those in need. If someone begs for money from an individual or even from the church, and this is a pattern over years and years and years and nothing changes, then obviously the money is not helping. The, the financial uh, burden is not the real burden that this person has. There needs to be something else. There needs to be a re-education on how to spend money. The person needs a class. This person needs to, to learn to make better decisions. And Paul addresses this same issue again in 1 Timothy tap, uh, chapter 5 when he's talking about widows. The same widows that James says in James chapter 1, to care for widows and orphans. And Paul says here in 1 Timothy, he says that we should help widows after, after they have received help from their own family, after they have reached a certain age, and after they have proven themselves to have, and I quote from 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 10 here, having a reputation for good works, brought up children, shown hospitality, washed the feet of the saints, cared for the afflicted, and devoted herself to every good work. And so in the same way that James talks about behavior in, in cooperation with faith, Paul never once neglects to talk about behavior in cooperation with faith. Our actions matter. What we do with the time that the Lord has given us matters. And that is the theme of James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. It is a continuation of the thought that James started in chapter 1 when he says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only. He separates hearers and doers again in 2.18 by saying, But someone will say, You have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. This is the faith equivalent of James saying, put your money where your mouth is. Now, I grew up with two brothers, and we comp one of them was a twin brother, and we competed about everything, absolutely everything. And uh, if, you, if you had competitive children, or maybe you have competitive children uh, now, uh, you will hear the phrase, want to bet, a lot within your life. I can do this, I can do this. Uh, you want to bet. Uh, that is, that is uh, the classic response. I can make more shots than you. Do you want to bet? Yeah. I can hold my breath longer than you. Do you want to bet? I can spit further than you. Do you want to bet? And all of those things were me and my brothers this past Thanksgiving. And so, <laughs> there is a way to determine disagreements. There is a way that you can put your money where your mouth is and show that you actually believe the things that you are saying. Hearers of faith 
do not compare to doers of faith. It's not a competition, but at the same time, our actions do prove what we actually believe. Are we willing to, to say that we have a faith? Are we willing to say that we follow a Lord and then actually see that played out within our life? The Lord knows the hearers. The Lord knows the doers. The Lord loves the hearers. The Lord loves the doers. But it's only the doers of faith who display real faith back to God. Again, James is more for self-reflection than how we identify with you know, others. You know, we, can, we have the, the big temptation here with the book of James to say, uh, you, know, you show me your faith, uh, you tell me you have faith, I'll show you my faith by my works. We have the real temptation to look at people, oh, this person's not doing this, and this person's not doing this, and we start to, to judge them because of what they're doing or what they're not doing. But James is more for self-reflection. We, we need to look at our own lives. What are we doing with our three T's? Time, talent, treasure. Is our time being used to help others? Are the opportunities for faith being seized? Or are they being neglected? Is our free time apart from work used for our own comfort? Or is it used for God's glory? Ethan Boger was just uh, sharing about the you know, spiritual gifts. And he talked about the spiritual gift of, of willingness just being, you know, wanting to, to do things for, for people. And what that is, whether he knows it or not, is the spiritual gift of generosity. We think of, you know, actually listed in the Bible, we think of generosity being with money. It's not just with our money. It's with everything that the Lord has given us. It's with our time. It's with the talents and the abilities, the strength, the wisdom that God has given us. And it is with our treasure. So what are we doing with our time? What are we doing with our talents? Are we keeping those for ourselves, saying, Lord, keep your hands off of these. These are mine. You may have given them to me, but I'm going to use them for, for my glory, for my prosperity and wealth building or whatever it may be. I'm not going to give them in any way back to the church. And lastly, our treasure. What are we doing with our money? What are we doing with our financial resources? If the only two things that we had to show people to describe our faith were not just the words of our mouth, but were our checkbook and our calendar, what would these two things say about us? If someone were to say, I want to, to see the type of faith that you have, show me how you spend your time, and show me how you spend your money. If someone were to, to do a spiritual audit of our time and our treasure, would there be enough evidence to say, yes, this person has faith in the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, the temptation of James is we start thinking about other people. We start comparing ourselves to other people. We start saying, well, maybe I'm not doing everything that I could, but I do more than this person. I spend more time working within the, uh, the ministry than, than this person. And so I must be doing okay. But it's not about other people. James is about you. It's about the self-reflection that takes place as we're trying to determine what type of, type of faith we have in God. What are we doing with our time, talent, and treasure? Are we doers of the word and not just hearers? This is a, a hard self-reflection to make, and we're really only getting started. The rest of this passage is actually more difficult. He continues in verse 19, You believe that God is one. So in other words, you believe in God. You profess faith in God. You know that God exists. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. The demons of the earth, the fallen angels of heaven, believe in God the same way that you do. They know that he is all-powerful. They know that he is the creator of the world. They know that he sent Jesus Christ, the Son, to die for the sins of humanity. They believe all of this. What separates them from us is that they care nothing about people. They care nothing about having their actions reflect the goodness of God. They are selfish, cruel, narcissistic. They only think about themselves. People of true faith will not look like that. Not just in what we profess, not just in what we say, not just in the, the songs that we sing and the prayers that we recite but what our lives actually look like. Our behavior will reflect Christ. 
And we know what that looks like through God's Word, the Bible. Biblically directed actions show trust and respect for God. Not just what we think is right or we think is wrong, but biblically directed actions show trust and respect for God. The Apostle Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 2, he reminds us, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. James tells us, Peter reminds us, that our conduct should be the same in the church and outside of the church. We are a group of people gathered here because we believe in God and we come together to worship. We enjoy worshiping together. It is not because we believe in God. There are billions of people outside of the Christian faith who believe in God. More than that, even the demons, the fallen angels, believe in the Christian God, in the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They believe in the power of the Father. They believe in the wisdom of the Spirit. And they believe in the saving power of the cross through Christ Jesus. But their actions do not show a trust or a respect for the goodness of God. That is supposed to be what separates us from them. That's the only, that only seen when we follow biblical commands and directions regarding righteousness. And what James says about biblical conduct is that it will be good in the eyes of faith or in the eyes of God. It will also be good in the eyes of the world. Everyone agrees it's right to help the poor who are really poor. Everyone agrees it is right to help widows who are truly widows. Everyone agrees it is right to seek justice when evil is done against innocent people. This set of morals is not something that was discovered by Western intellectuals as they were building a society. These are the principles that God has given to ensure moral behavior and righteous conduct. They are directly tied to faith. We can't separate them. That is the difference between us and the demons of Matthew chapter 8, Mark chapter 1, Luke 4, 24, and Luke 4, 41, where they recognize Jesus and they say, have you come to destroy us? They know who he is. They know the power that he has. There is no question in their mind. But they don't trust, they don't respect, and they don't seek after the goodness of God. Their behavior does not reflect what they know to be true. And that is why we do not divorce our faith from the overflow of our spirit that leads to action. The faith that we have will direct our hands to righteous action, or the lack of faith that we have will direct our hands to selfish ambition. There is no middle ground. James uses his own illustration to demonstrate this with the examples of Abraham and Rahab. Let's look at Abraham first. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. And so you see, verse 24, that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. How do we know that Abraham believed God? Well, if you look in Genesis, you do see some because Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, so Moses wrote Genesis. We do see some, um, some commentary on the thoughts of Abraham's mind and the thoughts of Abraham's heart and what he is, he is believing and what he is trying to do. So we do, we do have some of that from the author. But there's also the proven actions of his hands and his feet. Between, between Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 22... There are 12 identified ways that Abraham's faith was tested. He has to make decisions. He's going to behave in a certain way. And he responds in righteousness. It's also worth noting there are at least three ways in which Abraham failed in the test of righteousness. With the king of Egypt, with the king of Gerar, and with Hagar. But in each of those cases, Abraham repented of his sin, and that was counted to him as righteousness as well. So even in our failure, it's easy to read this passage in James chapter 2 
and to think, if I'm not perfect, if I don't do everything right, if I'm driving down the road and, and I feel directed by God to, to help somebody and I don't do it, then I must be, you know, I must be unsaved. I must be somebody who is, who is outside of the grace of God. It's easy to, to read this and to think ourselves, we have to be perfect. But that's not true either. We were, we were born into a world of sin. We're going to sin. We're going to be imperfect. And that is why we need the grace of God. Not just that we have the grace of God, but why we need the grace of God. It is still God's choice for his people to be in fellowship with him. And thankfully, we have these biblical examples of, of directed actions towards righteousness because apart from that, we would not be able to know what is right and what is wrong. That was Abraham. What about Rahab? Verse 25, in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. Rahab is a woman whose entire life was spent in sinfulness until she saw the power of God, until she experienced the power of God. And when that happened, she immediately followed him. And as we mentioned during Advent, this faith, this belief, was counted to her as righteousness to the point that she was included in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And so it doesn't matter what happened in your past. The, the, the message of James chapter 2 is do what is righteous today. Live righteously today. Desire to live righteously tomorrow. God's faithful people are men and women of faithful action. Every single day we should ask ourselves two important questions. Who am I trusting and what am I working for? We trust lots of people. I trust many of you. I trust my wife completely. I even trust my children with certain things. Certain things. But everyone on that list is fallible. And everyone on that list is going to make mistakes. Everyone on that list has made mistakes and will make mistakes in the future. If we are trusting first and foremost, in anything other than God, we are setting ourselves up for a hard time and for a difficult situation. We're going to be setting ourselves up for sin. And then we have to ask ourselves, what are we working towards? We work to provide for ourselves and for our family. We work for goals that we have, even some good goals, to help other people in some way, to be generous, to help the mission of the church help the needy around the world, whatever it may be. But what, if we are not first of all concerned about glorifying God with our work, then we are going to be setting ourselves up for failure. Even the greatest success will leave us empty. If you look through Genesis, if you look through Genesis 12 through Genesis 22, it wasn't Abraham's wealth or his lands or his prosperity that was counted to him as righteousness. It was his faith. And he understood that. It was his faith-directed actions that were counted as righteousness. This is what is really important. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 to this young pastor, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Once again, we have Paul, the champion of Saved by Grace Through Faith, reminding the people that God's faithful people are men and women of faithful action. And Paul says that this is important so that we can take hold of of that which is truly life. Take hold of the way in which God truly wants us to live in fellowship with him and in fellowship with each other. What this means is without faith, we are not truly living. Without faith, we cannot possibly receive all the blessings that God wants to give to us. And without action, we can't really have any faith. They are Again, in cooperation with each other so that they can be used for the good work of God. Faith, apart from biblically directed action, is worthless. This section ends with one of the most direct statements in the New Testament. 
Verse 26, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. This statement brings everything that James has talked about to this point in the letter, not just in verses 14 to 26, but everything that he has discussed to this point in the letter. He sums it up. He tells us to be doers and not hearers. He warns the rich. He tells us to care for widows and orphans. He tells us to keep ourselves unstained from the the ideologies and the sinfulness of the world. He warns us against the sin of favoritism, and now he explains that all of these things are part of faith. Action is a part of faith. And without action, faith is lifeless. It doesn't exist. I don't want any of us to be confused that, that actions somehow save us. We are not judged on how good we are versus how bad we are. If we were held to a standard of works-based righteousness, none of us would find God's favor. It would be outside of our control. Our actions, biblically directed actions, come out of the overflow of the Spirit. Our spirit is dead until it is brought to life by the Holy Spirit of God. We are not truly living, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, until our spirit is brought to life by God. Our actions are worthless apart from living them out in faith. Just like Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, they had position that served the people of Israel. They had a position that served the, the temple and the tabernacle. They had a position of respect and power. And yet God looked at them and said, these are worthless men. Why? Because their spirit was dead. They had all of this knowledge and they had all of these things that they were doing, but their spirit was dead. Everything that they did was not being done to glorify God. It was being done to glorify self. Actions without faith don't please God. And faith without actions don't please God. Belief and behavior equals our true faith. And after Eli and after his sons... Samuel becomes the prophet of Israel, and Samuel ends up lecturing King Saul on what God desires. He says, God does, not, uh, does God have as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. I love to worship together as a church. I love the organized Uh, ministries that we have that we're able to do together as a church. I love learning together and discipling each other. It's a great joy of my week every single week. But we are together for only a short portion of time during the week. Most of the time we spend apart from each other, with other people or by ourselves. I want us to be a a group of people, I want us to be a church who are known as as having the same faith and the same faithful actions outside the church as inside the church. And I'll tell you something else. I have confidence that we're doing this. I have confidence that we are people who don't just care for the ones that you can look around and see right now, but actually care for the people outside of this church. Those who don't know the goodness and the grace of God. Those who need help, not just spiritually, but also physically with the needs of life. I see the way that you care about your neighbors and I see the way that you pray for each other and I see the way that you are concerned for people that you don't even know. First Baptist is not a place with a dead faith and you are not a people of dead faith, but we need this constant reminder. We need this constant self-reflection. Not looking at other people. I'm doing more than this person. I'm doing a little bit less than this person. What am I doing for the Lord? What is my relationship like with the Lord. Don't worry about other people so much in terms of what they're doing or what they're not doing. How are you serving the Lord? And this is not so that we can earn our way into God's good graces. That was accomplished for us by Jesus on the cross. It's so that the people outside of this building can look at us and they can know God's grace and they can know the hope that rests in Jesus Christ. And they can take part in it as well. Through your belief 
and through your behavior, you can show the city of Reedsville the true faith that you have, the true faith in Jesus Christ.